We pick up our story in 1975, two years after the release of Pink Floyd's huge breakthrough LP, Dark Side of the Moon, and the album is still on the charts. Pink Floyd was no longer a group of boyhood friends who'd formed a band, no longer just another up-and-coming group, nor even the darlings of the psychedelic underground. With the unprecedented commercial success of Dark Side of the Moon, Pink Floyd was now a bona fide phenomenon. They had done this by going against almost every cliche which conventional wisdom deemed necessary for success. Their albums featured long instrumental pieces, sometimes running over 20 minutes in length, without any of the standard pop hooks thought to be essential to sell records. Their concerts had become elaborate, large-scale productions, which gave birth to an entirely new concept called theatrical rock. And now, a thematic album, which showed no signs of going away after 104 weeks on the Billboard charts. They seemed to have broken new ground with every step they had ever taken. And yet, there was one cliche that even Pink Floyd could not sidestep. And that was the dangers of success. We'll begin this hour with David Gilmore and his recollections of Pink Floyd's journey beyond the dark side of the moon. And I remember going and then playing outdoor stadiums, one in Florida, I can particularly remember, which I think was the first one on the next. To, and uh, the audiences we'd always had had been so quiet and respectful. And suddenly we'd got hit single audience who just shouted for money all the way through. and. Uh, all the, you just couldn't get away with the, some of the quiet pieces of music that we'd done previously, and it sort of, it was the end of an era. It was the beginning of another era, but it was the end of an era as well. That huge success thing, it's, it pre prevented certain things. And that's just life. Just, it, it, you, you just couldn't do some of the quiet, beautiful interlude bits that we, we used to like doing. The audiences before, you could hear a pin drop in our, in our gigs, you know. It's absolute silence going on because they were listening to these tiny little things that we used to do. And uh, when Dark Side of the Moon is that big, suddenly there's sort of 50,000 people in front of us instead of 10. And uh, half of them would be young kids up the front shouting for their favorite songs. We'd never had that before, and that was really, we didn't like that. I mean, I, I hated it. I, and, that probably is the start of the separation. Writer, bass player, and vocalist, Roger Waters. 73 was Dark Side of the Moon, 75 was Wish You Were Here. All right, well, 77 needs to be something as well. Let's make another record. And I'm not sure that there was really a record ready to be made. However, having said that, one of the songs, uh, which turned out to be called Dogs in the End, uh, had originally been called Raving and Drooling. And I had written prior to Wish You Were Here. And in fact, it was one of the first serious fights that David Gilmore and I had, was about whether or not that should be included in the Wish You Were Here record. He thought it should, and I said, no, it's not to do with it. This record is now about absence. This song doesn't fit, and it shouldn't be on it. And there was a whole load of stuff. I mean, it, it's a funny thing. That was kind of um, really the beginning of the end of the band was Wish You Were Here, because it was actually about Wish We Were Here. During the first week of 1975, Pink Floyd entered Abbey Road Studios in London to begin work on the follow-up album to Dark Side of the Moon. And although they had substantial pieces of music already sketched out, all was not well in the Pink Floyd camp. The overwhelming critical, commercial, and financial success of Dark Side of the Moon had left Pink Floyd emotionally drained. Messrs. Gilmore, Mason, Wright, and Waters spent most of the first couple of weeks in the Abbey Road Studios just sitting around. And when they did get around to playing, their bodies were going through the motions while their minds and their feelings were somewhere else. It seemed apparent that the group's soaring popularity around the world had caught the Floyd somewhat by surprise, and that the band had yet to get a grip upon its radically changed circumstances. Here's Roger Waters. The hanging around is a struggling band. You know, the 19, 20 year olds or younger they are often, um, kids you start the band you start trying to write songs you this and that and the other you maybe get it the the end of that dream for us was dark side of the moon you know pink floyd fulfilled its fu necessary function with dark side of the moon yeah, a big hit record 
Beyond that, I'm, I'm still surprised that I can make a living doing this. David Gilmore and Nick Mason agree that the early days of recording the album Wish You Were Here were very difficult because of the phenomenal response to the album Dark Side of the Moon. It was a very difficult period for us, I have to say. Um, all your childhood dreams had been sort of realized. Uh, we had had the biggest selling record in the world and uh, we had made money and uh, all the things that you got into it for, the girls and the, the money and the fame and all that stuff, it was all, sorry Nick, <laughs> looking terribly embarrassed. <laughs> uh, everything everything had, uh, had come our way and it was, you had to reassess what you were in it for thereafter and it was a pretty confusing and sort of empty time for a while. But um, I'm, I, for one, would have to say I, that I would say that it's my favourite album, which you hear, um, um, the end result of all that, whatever it was, it, it definitely has, has left an album that I can, I can live with very, very happily. I, I like I think it very it, much. It's partly that it was a struggle to, to make the album. I think you, you just, there's perhaps a feeling that once you've had the big hit album, the next one should roll off a little easier. And in fact, like so many things, each rung of the ladder is, is equidistant. And it's just as difficult to make the next album as it, it was the one before. Harder. Harder. Mm. It, it was just, um, you know, the pressure of following something like Dark Side of the Moon. You try it one day. Yeah, you just try it. <laughs> you try following Dark Side of the Moon one day. We, we still are. <laughs> For the first seven months of 1975, they would meticulously craft their next masterpiece. This was no easy feat, considering the emotional and physical toll that Dark Side of the Moon had exacted on each member of the band. Keyboardist Rick Wright discusses the pressure of following up that unprecedented success. It was very hard, and we had uh, a lot of soul-searching, if you like, doing it. Um, we did, well, it was Wish You Were Here. And we, in a way, we were sort of going through the motions, and Nick was playing the drums. He really wasn't putting his heart into it, because Dark Side of the Moon was, a, you know, huge success. And I think all of us were sort of maybe guilty of sort of... One, we didn't know really what we could do next, and two... Maybe it was a period in our career when we were just getting a bit lazy. But funny enough, out of that, I, for me, I think it's, well, as I said, it's my favorite album. Some eight years after the departure of Sid Barrett, his presence was still being felt. He became the subject of a song which Roger Waters wrote for him called Shine On You Crazy Diamond. You were caught in the crossfire of childhood and stardom, yeah. blown on the steel breeze. Explain Steel Breeze, this is a recurring theme in the album. Steel Breeze, well, he was seriously cut up by the winds that were wafting him through those early days of rock and roll, you know, that's all. It, you know, he was carved by it. Cut up? Yeah. In the next verse, you, you say that he reached for the secret too soon. I take that as the secret of life. Yeah. I don't know what he was reaching for, but he was out there. You know, he wanted all the answers. He was interested in all the shortcuts to whatever it is. Yeah. See, he wanted to make the connections. The epic Shine On, You Crazy Diamond offers a loving and somewhat bittersweet tribute to Fallen Floyd founding member Sid Barrett. David Gilmore tells us about coming up with the initial music for the song. The whole thing started out of that first guitar thing, ding, 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 and I was just in the studio rehearsal room we were doing one day, and I was just playing with the guitar, and those notes started coming out, just a little motif on the guitar. When I played it a few times, and I put some DDL and some other effects on it, started playing again, and it sort of pinged out, and it sounded nice. And I was thinking, oh, that's really great and it really roger got really got off on it he did you know he got exactly the same from it as i was getting from it and i don't know quite how it happened i mean but that those sort of things happen once in a while and um that was like the start point that gave us the start for making the whole record in the tradition of adam hart mother and echoes some of pink floyd's more lengthy pieces that shine on you crazy diamond parts one through five Augmenting the atmospheric sounds of the band and the conceptual lyrics of Roger Waters were creative sound effects. On the album, Wish You Were Here, Waters was the main architect to the use of these additional elements to the music. He was asked if these extra soundscapes ever overshadowed the music, potentially digging Pink Floyd into a creative hole. Well, no, it's not a hole for me. 
I can imagine it might be for others, but I, it's, you know, it's the way I work. When people ask me this question, I tend to say to them, uh, because people often say to me, don't you ever feel that you'd just like to go into a, into a pub with an acoustic guitar and just sing the songs and play? And, uh, and um, the answer really is, yeah, sometimes it, w it would be nice to go with the band into a pub, and we get that feeling when we're in a rehearsal hall. We're all crammed into a little room and we play the music, and it's enjoyable uh, to play it just for ourselves and the few people who are listening in there. But really what I do is the other thing. It's a bit like saying to Jackson Pollock, yeah, yeah, sure, there's all these great big canvases covered in little in squiggles, you know, but don't you ever feel that you'd rather be sitting in a field doing a... a, a, a 10 by 9 inch watercolour of, of a daisy or something. To him, to ask that question of him would be a ridiculous question to ask. And uh, I think we have a tendency to perceive rock and roll in a very narrow way, those of us who are interested in it. We perceive it in a way that we, you, we wouldn't dream of perceiving literature or painting, for instance in the same terms, because they're much older. It's because rock and roll is only 40 years old. We, we have this natural tendency to want to crush it all together in the same pigeonhole and say, rock and roll is this or it's that. Do you feel rock and roll is moving more towards a more humanistic approach and away from the this? Well, you know, yeah, bits of it are and bits of it aren't. You know, it's diverse. It can't, you know, it, it can't, it's not all Thomas Mann and it's not all Enid Blyton or Harold Robbins. It's very, very diverse form and should be allowed to be so. You know, when, when, when the idea to use something pops into your mind when you're making a record, you just go and find it and do it. And the ideas do pop into my mind, so I do, I do them. And that's the way I make the pieces. Welcome to the Machine is one of the most ominous yeah. of all Pink Floyd songs. And other than Sid specifically, do you think that most people are in danger of getting ground up in the gears to one degree or another? Yeah, I guess it's just this song about that. It's pretty obvious. Well, thanks for being so <laughs> flippant because I'm going to have to use this song. Never mind. I'll ask Gilmore. God, it's a long time ago. I can... yeah, it's all done to a sort of synthesized train sort of noise. Saying, I oh, know, I can't really remember. <laughs> I don't want to set that one up for you. You can set that one up. Look, Roger can set that one up. <laughs> Gee, thanks, Dave. I, I love the song, you know. I think what's more interesting about it, rather than its content, is the use of the VCS-3, which was one of the original synthesizers. And that with a tape delay on it, all that. All those kind of machine-like noises in the background um, were generated by this particular synthesizer, one of which I still have, I'm happy to say. And I use it to this day. Because it's an analogue machine, it makes sounds that none of the new digital synthesizers will, will make. Uh, because it's so technically simple. And uh, I thought that was great. I, th I love that that kind of rhythmic effect, and it was kind of breaking new ground musically, and uh, in those days, um, the song "Welcome, the song, Welcome, the What Did You?" Oh, it's all that stuff about buying guitars and punishing your ma and all that stuff. Yeah, well, there you go. I mean, you can't. It's kind of self-explanatory. We don't have to talk about those lyrics, surely. Rick Wright recalls recording that epic track. It's got a classic fantastic rhythm behind it and uh, I loved playing the synth solo on that and basically the synth solo was it was a profit five and it was uh, going through a loop delay so I had to try I had to play to the delay and um, yes it's a great song and uh, that is for me that song is very typical of why I like Wish You Were Here as an album actually. On 1973's worldwide hit album The Dark Side of the Moon Roger Waters had made a deliberate shift in his lyrical content from the cosmically obtuse to the highly personal. Some of Waters' sharp elbows were evident in his amusing, not quite politically correct barbs aimed at the music business tycoons that were emerging by the mid-70s. Side two of the album begins with the song Have a Cigar, another biting indictment about the record business. David Gilmore explains. One would meet an awful lot of record company people 
who would have that sort of have a cigar mentality and uh, I don't know quite uh, what made Rogers start writing that one but it was a very very common thing in which we used to amuse ourselves with endlessly um, to prevent ourselves from being driven mad with rage about it by the uh, we had we had people who would say to us, you know, which one's pink and stuff like that. They genuinely would. They think that there, there were an awful lot of people who thought Pink Floyd was the name of the lead singer, and uh, that was Pink himself and the band. That's how that all came about. It's it's um, it's quite genuine. Another sarcastic viewpoint of the record industry by Pink Floyd's Roger Waters. That's entitled "Have a Cigar," featuring longtime Pink Floyd label mate Roy Harper on lead vocals. And we were doing the. Uh finishing off our album and uh, Roy came into a session and suggested that he do some singing and we said fine do some and stuck him out there straight away in front of a microphone and got on with it. The actual recording of it originally took some time I can't remember how long a couple of a uh, couple of sessions I think it took because uh, he's never really done anything he's never really sung anyone else's lyrics before I don't think and um, I guess he finds it a little bit strange working to someone else's uh, wishes, you know, to, to work within the confines of someone else's work. Worked out very well. He sang Have a Cigar at Nebworth. Mm. He'd come on tour and sing Have a Cigar every night if he likes next time we go out. <laughs> <laughs> Drummer, Nick Mason. Well, the problem with, with rock and roll is that it's seen, it has a, a sort of public face. But at the end of the day, it's another business. So it's like uh, most people expect people to behave appallingly in business and stab each other in the back and be generally rather horrid. Rock and roll is really rather similar, but it's sometimes superheated because of the money involved or the fame or whatever, and the business of who gets credit for what and all the rest of it. Once again, David Gilmore. Just an awful period for some reason. Due to success, I think, you know, feeling the pressure of having to carry on and do stuff I, I it was a very very uncomfortable period and the, that it was not a great tour um, doing those three bits of music um, it's not a good fun period a very difficult period for all of us I mean right there is well documented through the making of the wish you're here album we were moving around a lot more of the world you know we were going more places doing more stuff. it was taking longer to record and to write you know, the, we were getting more perfectionist about how we did things, so things were taking longer and longer, and we wanted to have some time off. We were wanting to spend more time with families and, uh, and doing other things in life, you know, as one does want to do as one gets older. Um, focusing 100% of one's time and energy on, on music and career lasts so long that there comes a point when you want to change that focus a little bit. Following in the direction of Dark Side of the Moon, the album Wish You Were Here was the second album in a row where Waters' lyrics maintained a conceptual theme. By this time in the band's career, Rogers' lyrical concepts and the musical contributions of David Gilmour and Rick Wright were very balanced. Ironically for Waters, writing was one thing he was not encouraged to do when he was a student in school. I was told very firmly all through my school days that there was no question of me ever being involved in writing anything. You know, my essays or whatever would come back with bad marks and just hopeless, you know, forget, absolute writer. So I would say, you know, to anybody out there who still is facing this, this problems with people who are not um, involved in education in, in the Greek sense, which is, um, you know, to, to draw out the best that is in a child or, a, or an individual. Um, take heart, you know, because I, I suddenly discovered that all I had to do was be honest and say what I felt, and I discovered I had a knack of being honest and saying what I feel and strumming the guitar or playing the piano a little bit at the same time, and I, and I made a living out. That's not what's important, though. What's important is, is I think, for yourself to do it. If you, if you want to be creative in any way, it doesn't matter. You don't have to be Michelangelo, you know, or John Lennon. You can just be you and, and do it at home. Do it for fun. Don't give up your day job. Wish You Were Here seems to be not only a lament for Sid's premature departure from reality, but a question as to the quality of one's life in general. Would you agree with that? 
Yes. Are we going to have any more of these answers? <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. You keep asking those long, complicated, very well written, I have to say, questions. And uh, you'll go and get monosyllabic answers. Um, you, you obviously, you listened to the record last week and wrote these questions. You have me at a disadvantage. This is true. This is true. I actually did prepare for this interview. <laughs> I'm sorry. That won't happen again. I can see that coming. Uh, listen, yes. <laughs> I mean, yes and yes and a thousand times yes. God, I wish you were here, Roger. That's what I'm wishing right now. No, I am here. And, uh, and I'm, uh, I think you wish you were here, the song. Wish yes. You were here. I love that song. You know, it's the only song that I've co-wrote with um, David that I do. No other song that I do when I'm doing gigs was co-written by anybody. That's the only one. But I love that song so much. Not least um, his guitar riff, you know, going, go, 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 which I think is really lovely. It still kind of brings tears to my eyes when I sing it because it's so important to every day in my life and, and I, in my view, in everybody's life. You know, how I wish, how I wish you were here because we, we fail to make the connections that we ought to. Play that in the, um, in the control room of number three studio at Abbey Road. And um, it's just something I'd been strumming at home. And Roger immediately said, what's that, what's that? And we had to sort of immediately get on with that and work it up and write the rest of the music and stuff. A couple of strange occurrences took place during the making of the Wish You Were Here album, both involving the song Shine On You Crazy Diamond. David Gilmore and Nick Mason of Pink Floyd tell us about the first weird happening. Um, I remember doing the backing track. We had one problem making the actual backing track for Shine On, um, where we had a new desk, new console in the studio, and no one was 100% certain how it worked. And the, the whole echo returns of everything that we were doing was uh, recorded onto the drum tracks, which uh, meant that when we went to the drum tracks on their own, when we finally took everything else out and said, can we have the echo off this or the echo off that? And they said, well, we can't seem to get rid of it. And we took everything else out of the mix and listened to the drums on their own. We found that there was this massive echo from other instruments all over the drums. So we did actually have to go and start all over again and, and, and re-record it. So there, were, so there was a bit of cursing and swearing about that as it had, had taken a day or two to get that track done. We, I think... And we I were very have... happy with the actual performance. Mm. I think also there was a point at which, when, with the invention of the 16-track um, and 2-inch tape, there was a belief for quite a while that it, there would be something intrinsically wrong in editing tape that big. So consequently, whenever we played these pieces, they had to be played through from beginning to end, and particularly for Roger and myself, the, as the um, rhythm section, which would be laid down first. This was a fairly tough business because the whole thing had to be sort of right and, and had to be memorised because you would yeah. probably be not listening to any other instruments or vo vocals. So you Absolutely. Had no... So it was a pretty weird thing. I mean, I don't think I could remember that much stuff now. If you read some of the initial reviews of Wish You Were Here in 1975, you may be surprised and perplexed to find that more than one writer gave Pink Floyd a critical pasting in spite of the album's obvious popularity with number one sales. Roger Waters reminds us that certain negative reviews may have had more to do with temper tantrums over lack of access than the actual music on the album Wish You Were Here. We didn't do press, you see. We never spoke to anybody. I've got a, a very old friend called Gary Stromberg. In fact, he is the man who introduced me to my wife, for which I will be eternally grateful. He introduced us because he was employed on one of the tours, the Wish You Were Here tour. 1975, to do our publicity. His brief was no. <laughs> and that was it. 
We said, Gary, we want you to come on the whole tour and deal with the press and the media in every way possible. And the answer is no. Can we have to... No. Can we do an interview? No. Can we take... For no. Can we no. All you have to do is keep saying no, and that's your job. Having interviewed all four members of Pink Floyd, past and present, at length, about all of the eras of their long career, I'm asked by ardent fans often to try to explain why that lineup of Waters, Gilmore, Wright, and Mason couldn't continue making brilliant music together after The Wall in 1979. There have been volumes written on the subject, but I think it can best be explained by the band members themselves in the following two descriptions of the same thing. Prior to his death in September 2009, original Pink Floyd keyboard player Richard Wright went on the record with me in the studio to explain his statement that 1975's Wish You Were Here album was his favorite. It's hard to say. It just happens to be the album that, for me, just from the moment it starts till it finishes, it flows. The songs flow into each other, and it's just a wonderful feeling in it, a band feeling which hadn't happened on Moments You Lapse of Reason. I wasn't on Final Cut. I was, I was on the wall, but again, it wasn't a band. Thing. And we wanted both Dave I, and Nick, I can speak for them, I think, and myself, really liked a, the feeling we had on Dark Side of the Moon and Wish You Were Here. After that, if, I mean, Animals, it, we lost that band feeling. And then I asked Roger Waters to describe the exact same period that Rick Wright, David Gilmore, and Nick Mason all agree resulted in one of their best Pink Floyd albums ever. Dark Side of the Moon was really the... that was a band. But I think bands get together and they want to be successful and they want to be this and they want to be that. And I think with Dark Side of the Moon we achieved everything that we could. Wish You Were Here was a very good title for that album and has been reasonably well documented in other interviews and things. Uh, I've often said what that album should really have been called was Wish We Were Here because uh, we weren't really. And already the rot had set in and the only thing that was holding Pink Floyd together at uh, that time was uh, fear and avarice. You know, there's the fear that if you split up your world will fall apart. You know, you know, when you have a golden goose like Pink Floyd, it's very hard to let go of it. The other fateful event happened during the final mixing of the song Shine On You Crazy Diamond, when an obese and balding Sid Barrett was discovered lurking around their studio. I came into the studio and only, I think, Roger was there. And he was sitting at the desk and I came in and I saw this guy sitting behind huge, bald, fat guy. Mm, I thought, he looks a bit strange. Anyway, so I sat down with Roger at the desk and um, we worked for 10 minutes and this guy kept on getting up and brushing his teeth and then sit doing really weird things, but keeping quiet. And I said to Roger, who is he? And then after a while, Roger said, do you know who that guy is? And uh, anyway, it took me a long time and then suddenly I realized it was Sid after maybe 45 minutes. He came in as we were doing the vocals for Shine On You, Crazy Diamond, which was basically about Sid. And he just for some incredible reason, he picked the very day that uh, we were doing a song which was about him. And we hadn't seen him, I don't think, for two years before. David Gilmore fills us in on more of the story. He'd uh, shaved off all his hair, and, and none of us recognised him for about half an hour. And um, eventually one of us just sort of went, that's Sid. Didn't recognise him at all. Shaved, and shaved bald head and very plump. He'd shaven all his hair off. He was about probably 17, 18 stone. I mean, his eyebrows, everything. I had no idea who he was for a long time, and neither did anybody else, I didn't think, for a while. He was jumping up and down, brushing his teeth. I mean, it was awful. And uh, I was... I mean, Roger was in tears. I think I was... We were both in tears. I mean, it was very shocking. When I think about it, I can still see his eyes. But uh, it was everything else that was, was different. Seven years of no contact, and then to walk in while we're actually doing that particular track. 
I don't know, coincidence, karma, fate, who knows, but it was very, very, very powerful. The irony, of course, is that much of which you were here, and in particular, the song Shine On You Crazy Diamond was about the rise and fall of Sid Barrett, Pink Floyd's co-founder and original guitarist, vocalist, and main songwriter. None of the members of Pink Floyd ever saw Sid Barrett again until his death in 2006. But that hasn't stopped Sid Barrett fanatics from keeping the flame lit. Here's Roger Waters. If our hobby is to be interested in Pink Floyd and whether Sid did this or did that or what kind of shoes he wore on March the 18th, 1967 or whatever, well, who am I to say that that's obsessive? I mean, some people collect stamps, you know. I, I mean, it's better than watching Ninja Turtles on TV, you know. Being a Sid Barrett fan seems to me to be a perfectly legitimate and reasonable way of spending your spare time making a study of... He was a very interesting man. He wrote some fantastic songs. There's a body of work which is there, and unfortunately it's complete. You know, there won't be any more, I don't think. Um, he was a visionary. He was an extraordinary musician. He started Pink Floyd. Well, I mean, Sid and I started the band together, but if he hadn't been there, nothing would have happened. I'd be working for an architect now. I might be my own boss by now. I probably would. But I would not be doing the, the work that I'm doing, I don't think. He was, you know, he was the key that unlocked the door to rock and roll for me. The Wish You Were Here album debuted in the UK at number one, followed by topping the sales in the US the following week. The latest figures estimate more than 13 million copies sold of Wish You Were Here. Readers of Q Magazine ranked Wish You Were Here at number 34 on the Greatest Albums list, while Rolling Stone writers listed at number 209 on their top 500 albums all time. Pink Floyd guitarist singer David Gilmour explains the history of the bonus live tracks of Wish You Were Here. The versions of Raving and Drooling and You Gotta Be Crazy, which appear on the Wish You Were Here one, I guess which are both from the same concert, because those three tracks are the things we were working on in 1974, after Dark Side of the Moon and before Wish You Were Here. And two of them went, one of them went on to Wish You Were Here, and the other two went on to the Animals album later. And so there are live early versions with different lyrics of, of those things on these, on two of these albums. It's hard to shine on more brightly than any other release, but the diamond that sparkles finally made available first time 5.1 channel surround sound remixes of the Wish You Were Here album, as well as mid-70s attempts at multi-channel surround called Quadraphonic. They're all on the five disc immersion edition of Wish You Were Here. David Gilmore sorts out the history. There was a Quadraphonic mix done at the time, um, I believe. Um, we were always too busy to get involved in the, the quad mixes that we did of Dark Side of the Moon and Wish You Were Here at the time. You know, they came out on some, I think, some strange quadraphonic vinyl format that at least three people in the world had players that could play, I guess. And it, so it never seemed that sort of vital that we should uh, get that involved in it. And um, the, the care and the work, you know, the, the care and the work that goes into the mix of an album is so enormous and so concentrated um, that having to then go and do it again for a quad thing that was going to sell three um, was not something we all got that involved in. But um, these things are still there, they still exist, and they're really good, and they're, they're, they're worth listening to. Dark Side of the Moon, of course, has been remixed to, and, and wish you were here, in fact, have been to the modern sort of 5-1 type quad mix as well. And those ones have had a lot of care lavished on them, so... Um, if I were going to listen to one, I'd be tend more to, towards the five ones than the actual chord ones. But uh, hey, it's all there for anyone. I'm not sure about how objective one can be. Um, to me, it's a matter of finally getting over being a little too precious, in um, too careful in allowing things to be released, sort of a little bit warts and all. And there are tons and tons of bits and pieces of music and film that we've never considered were right to go into our front of the of the pack stuff. But a lot of these bits and pieces are out in terrible quality on the net in bootleg form. And um, we figured we might as well, at this stage in our lives, find everything that, that, that has been done 
and put it all out there for, for, for people to have a listen to. As we started, we found more and more and more things um, that we'd completely forgotten about, and uh, we'd be sitting around brainstorming sessions, trying to remember titles of things that we'd forgotten about so that we could go and look for them, because you can't look for them if you haven't even got a title or anything. And so there are all sorts of little moments songs, tracks from, you know, the early Pink Floyd, 66, 67, before, Dark, before Piper at the Gates of Dawn, and extra stuff, live things, other recorded tracks, Stefan Grappelli playing on Wish You Were Here, T tons, tons and tons of stuff, and we figured it's time that all that stuff was, was released in, in nice, good quality. The completists could have their way. I think it's our best album. I love it um, lyrically, but I also love it just musically, and I love the the flow of it, and I just think, it, I mean, I I will listen to that album for pleasure. There's not many of the Floyd albums I can. I like the songs in it, I like the sounds in it, and that's that's it. I just, uh, I like the way the thing links together. I mean, it's not like Dark Side of the Moon so much, and particularly like the beginning and where it builds up into the sax and then into the song, and um, good. I just like listening to it. If you look at... The albums, if you look at the things, I think of my, my, sort of my favourite album, I suppose I would say, was the Wish You Were Here album. And, um, you know, the actual process of sitting together in a room with several musicians um, and actually playing, performing together from nothing is a very interesting, exciting sort of process. Uh, Dave, you've said in the past that um, you weren't as happy with the album Dark Side of the Moon as you were with Wish You Were Here. Now, why is that? What, what, what did that refer to? I don't know about not as happy with it. I was slightly concerned at the time that the direction, that uh, the strength of the lyrics was coming right to the forefront at that time. And I, th I thought at the time that there were one or two moments in that where we had uh, let the lyrics overshadow the music or we had, if you like, we had not created a sufficiently strong um, musical background or we hadn't explored some of the musical backgrounds enough should we say and in some ways i felt that uh, some of our strengths were being lost seems rather stupid to say it really as there's not many that would agree and um, but anyway i i felt that i still feel to a certain extent that uh, wish you were here has a greater balance to it of, of between music and lyric <laughs> 